power for living with Bishop Dale C. Bronner. If you would open your Bibles to the 10th chapter of the book of Acts, Acts chapter 10. I pray that you will hear God speak to you in a very special and relevant way in your life. Don't ever discount the fact that God still speaks to people. You don't have to be crazy for God to talk to you. I want you to know that God talks to sane people. And communion with God is the ability to be able to have him to talk to you and you talk to him. It is communication with God. When you really come and dine at his table, the communion that you have with him is an ability to be able to hear the voice of God. It is perhaps the greatest asset that you could ever have is just to be able to hear his voice how many mistakes could have been avoided in your life had you only heard the voice of the Lord and heeded to that voice? How that blesses our lives in such an incredible, incredible way. We honor him for being such a wonderful, wonderful God. Acts chapter 10. Beginning with the first verse, there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called, was called the Italian Regiment, a devout man and one who feared God with all of his household and who gave alms generously to all people and prayed to God always. And about the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. And when he observed him, he was afraid and said, what is it, Lord? And so he said to him, your prayers and your alms have come up for a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa and send for Peter, for Simon, whose surname is Peter. He's lodging with Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea, and he will tell you what you must do. And when the angel who spoke to him had departed, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier from among those who waited on him continually. And so when he had explained all these things to them, he sent them to Joppa. And then notice verse 9, the next day, as they went on their journey and drew near the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And then he became very hungry and wanted to eat. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven opened and an object like a great sheet bound at the four corners descending to him and let it down, let down to the earth. And in it were all kinds of four-footed animals on the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, birds of the air. And a voice came to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter said, not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. And a voice spoke to him again the second time, what God has cleansed, you must not call common. And this was done three times, and the object was taken up into heaven again. I want to focus in this particular session on the cross-cultural ministry, cross-cultural ministry in the Acts series as we are studying now. It's interesting to see how God was doing something for the church. And the book of Acts is not merely descriptive for the church, it is prescriptive for the church. We find here a pattern of how we are to be the church today of the Lord Jesus Christ, empowered by the, by the unction and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. The world does not fear prayerless ministries. The world has no regard for ministries that do not have any Holy Spirit power in them. It is the power and the anointing of the Holy Ghost. I hope you're not ashamed to say Holy Ghost. Say Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. Say help me Holy Ghost. Help me, Holy Ghost. I hope you know that when the Holy Ghost comes upon you, he will change you into another person. You don't do business as usual. 
is not just coming to church and listening to try to hear a little message and sing a few songs and then go back home and live your life as though you had just come to a concert. When you are empowered by the Holy Ghost, there is an anointing that is resident in you. The Holy Spirit is your teacher. And he will teach you what you need to say, what you need to do, when you need to close your mouth, when you need to sit down, when you need to stand up, when you need to move forward, when you need to hold still. He'll speak to you. God will give you guidance. He has not left us comfortless or helpless in this earth. He empowered the early church with the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit. The anointing of the Holy Ghost is to undo burdens and to destroy yokes. He came by the power of the Spirit of the living God to outdo, undo, and overdo everything the devil has done. Satan is wreaking havoc in marriages, in families today across the globe. This is not just happening in American society. It is happening in Europe. It's happening in Asia. It is happening in Africa. It's happening in Latin America. It's happening all over the world. The family is under attack, and we have the Holy Ghost. Yes. And there's something that we are to rise in strength and in power and rise up and become who and what God has called us to be. We didn't come to have church, we are the church. We came to be the church. It is so interesting. You'll see over in Acts chapter 6 and verse 7 where the Bible talks about the word of God spread and the number of disciples multiplied greatly. When the word spread, the word was spreading and then the number of disciples multiplied greatly. Two things were happening. The word was spreading. The word grew and then as the word grew, the number of the disciples multiplied greatly. Then you'll find in Acts chapter 9 and verse 31, we see that the churches throughout Judea and Galilee and Samaria were multiplied. The churches. Initially, it was the word that grew. And then as the word grew, the disciples grew and multiplied. But then he takes it to the third level. It was here then that the churches throughout Judea and Galilee, Galilee and Samaria were multiplied. Now the church is multiplied. So things went from the multiplication of disciples to the multiplication of churches. This is what we call exponential increase. It's not just the multiplying of disciples. This is the multiplying of churches. And we see a pattern here. God calls the word to spread. When the word spreads, disciples ought to increase. We ought to know whether or not the word is spreading by seeing whether or not disciples are increasing or not. He didn't command us to go and make converts. The command of the Great Commission was to go and make disciples. Make disciples. A disciple is a learner. A disciple is a student. He's not merely a follower. He's a student of him. He listens to his voice. He learns from him. We learn a principle, a pattern here. We build the people and then we build the place. We build the people and then we build the place. Build the people and then we build the place. See, the word spread, and then the disciples grew and multiplied, and then the churches were multiplied. You don't try to build the place until you first built the people. You build the people, and then you build the, the place. I see so many people that invert the order of ministry. They try to build the church, and then think that you, if you can build the church, then you can build the people. No, no, no. You build the people first, and then you build the church. The church is the people. You build the people, and then you build the place. God's method is to change the people, and then God uses the people to change the place. It's just that simple. If God wants to change your house, God has to change somebody in your house. And God uses that somebody in your house to change the other folks in the house, and then it's called household salvation. He changes the person, and then he changes the, the place. He's not going to change your house and then change you. He changes you and then changes your house. God always changes the person, and then God uses the person to change the place. That's what happened on the day of Pentecost. These cloven tongues of fire came and sat on each of them. They heard this sound of a mighty rushing wind. They were filled with the Holy Ghost. It filled them. It filled the house. It filled the people. And when the people's lives were transformed, then the Bible says the place where they were was shaken. God changed the people, then he changed the place. God will change people, and then he uses people to change the place. And so he starts with multiplying disciples. Then he moves to multiplying churches or multiplying ministries. 
And let me just say this to you very clearly, that the single most effective evangelistic methodology under heaven is planting new churches. The single most effective evangelistic methodology under heaven is planting new churches. It is planting new churches. It means that more disciples are being built, that you're multiplying ministry. If you really want to plant for one year, plant corn. If you want to plant for a year, plant corn. You'll have corn next year. If you want to plant for a decade, plant trees. If you want to plant for decades, plant trees. If you want to plant for life, plant people. But if you want to plant for generations, plant churches. Because those churches will serve your great-grandmama, your grandmama, mama, child, grandchild, great-grandchild. When you really want to plant for the generations, plant churches. That's why I'm reminding you that the single most effective evangelistic methodology under heaven is the planting of new churches. It is the planting of new churches. And I want you to understand this very clearly, that the definition of exactly what a true church is will vary among theologians and Christian leaders. It, it varies. You, you get theology people, they get so deep on you. When the church of the Lord Jesus is really simple. Jesus said, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, my ecclesia, and the very gates of hell will not prevail against it. But here's what I believe a church is. A church exists wherever a group of believers meets together on a regular basis to celebrate their mutual faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, and where they lift up their voices together in worship and praise to Almighty God and where they are committed to each other in ministry and loving care, and where they agree to obey God to the best of their abilities. That's a church. That's a church. I want you to notice that. A church exists wherever a group of believers meets together on a regular basis to celebrate their mutual faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, and where they lift their voices together in worship and praise to God Almighty, where they are committed to each other in ministry, in loving care, and where they agree to obey God to the best of their abilities. That's a church. Church has very little to do whether or not it has stained glass windows or not. It has very little to do whether it has theater seating or whether it has pews or whether it has steel chairs or benches. It has very little to do whether it has, it's, it's a thatched roof or whether it is a sophisticated roof of, of modern technology. A church can take many forms, many, many forms, uh, from a group of people meeting up under a tree in Africa to a, a weekly meeting of Christian university students meeting in a dorm, to believers congregating in a hotel ballroom down in South America, to worshipers gathering together in a cathedral in England, uh, to disciples that are huddled together in, in, in a house in China in what we call the underground church, uh, to the, the customary local church in your neighborhood that you're accustomed to. And so the church might take on many different forms, but it is still the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. What is it? It is a place wherever a group of believers meets together on a regular basis to celebrate their mutual faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, where they lift their voices together in worship and praise to God Almighty, where they are committed to each other in ministry and loving care, and where they agree to obey God to the best of their ability. That's a church. And so it doesn't matter whether you're out having church under a, a brush arbor, whether you're sitting up under a tree and having church, or whether you're in a cathedral. It doesn't matter whether you're in the ballroom of a hotel that has been, that had a party there the night before, and now you, you're sanctifying it, and now you're having church in it the next day. It is that body of believers. They are the people that actually make the church who are filled with the Spirit of God. This is the temple that God says, I want to come and, and dwell in. He said, I'm not coming in a place made with hands. I, I want to come in and, and, and make up, take up my tabernacle with you. I want to live in you. I want to be in you. And so here we, we, we see that the, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are, we are called. We're called of God 
to, to be his hand extended to the world. Uh, you know, the messengers in, in Revelations chapter 1 uh, are, are really uh, the right hand of God. They, this, this right hand of God, this is the fivefold ministry of the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, and the teacher. It, it is God's way in which he reaches unsaved people in the world. And you know when the Bible talks about how Jesus healed a man with a withered hand on the Sabbath day and it was not lawful and they're going to try to question him about healing somebody, it just makes me sick when you have religious people with their rules and regulations trying to lock down and block out common sense of ministering to people that are hurting on the Sabbath. And this, this, this withered hand, this withered hand, may I just say to you that this withered hand, it, this is the hand of the fivefold ministry of the apostle who governs, of the prophet who guides, of the evangelist who gathers, of, of the pastor who guards, of the teacher who grounds. This is the anthropomorphic hand of the Lord that God will use to reach people and to deliver them from wherever they are. Jesus said, which one of you having one of your sheep falling into a pit would not reach in there and get him even if it is the Sabbath? May I just tell you, it is a Sabbath now. The Sabbath is not merely a certain day and time. It is a rest that we enter into where we enter into the completed work of Jesus Christ. The promised land is the place where we enter into the work where Jesus has already finished the work and with his stripes we are healed. And you're not struggling trying to get free. You're already free. Ought not this daughter of Abraham that has been bound these 18 years, Jesus healed that woman on the Sabbath day. And he came in and he said, he didn't say, woman, I'm getting ready to lay hands on you and something is getting ready to happen. He said, woman, thou art loosed. If you'll ever step into the finished work of Jesus, he is looking to be able to take what is I would call now a withered hand. This is a withered prophet, a withered, withered apostle, a withered evangelist, a withered pastor, a withered teacher that has no ability to be able to reach in and grab folks out of a pit. May I tell you what the pit is? You don't have to wonder what it is. The Bible tells you what it is. If you're reading your Bible in Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 27, the Bible says, For a whore is a deep ditch, and a strange woman is a narrow pit. Have you ever gotten caught into some sexuality of where you're in a perverted lifestyle, living with somebody who has put something on you and you can't even help yourself. You find yourself going back to this pit and you're stuck in a place in life and we've got ministry gifts whose hands are withered and it is the Sabbath of God and Jesus is upset that his sheep are stuck in a pit and the hand of ministry is withered and bound. My God! If he could have them, just get his hands loose. And here, on the Sabbath day of God, he speaks to impotent, atrophied ministry and says, stretch forth your hand. My God, my God, my God, I feel something happening in this place. I really do. Oh, you came. I pray that you came for a divine setup tonight in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. If he's messed you up and you feel handicapped by your money, by your relationships, by your sleep, by your rest, by the condition of your physical body, I'm here to tell you in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Stretch forth your hands. Stretch forth. There's something that ought to be reaching forth from you. He wants to heal through you. Stand up, everybody. Stand up. Stand up. Stand up. In the name, the name, the name, the name that is above every name. That name, God was looking for somebody's hand. The arm of the Lord is not shortened that it cannot save. My God, he's able to save you, to deliver you, to use you for his glory. There are some people that are in pits. They're in pits of alcohol, pits of drugs, pits of perverted lifestyle. They are in pits, and our hands have been withered. We've not been able to make them move to be able to reach and pull sheep out of it. But this is the Sabbath rest of God. My Lord, he's speaking to his people right now. He's speaking to you. Look up, lift those hands up to God and say, Lord, use these hands for your glory. I stretch my hand to thee. No other help I know. If thou withdraw thyself from me, where would I go? Use these hands to deliver the
the sick. Use these hands to raise the dead. Use these hands to rescue sheep who have fallen in the pit. I consecrate these hands to you, Lord Jesus. Even now, use them for your glory. Save through these hands. Bless through these hands. Anoint through these hands. Instruct through these hands. Guide through these hands. Use me, Jesus. Hear me, my Lord. Send me. I stretch forth. I stretch forth. I stretch forth. My hand to rescue fallen sheep in the pit. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah to Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Some of you used to be in the pit yourself. He's going to let you help people that were just like you. He's going to lift you up. They will not stay there. I hear the voice of God saying they will not stay there. They won't stay there. They belong to Jesus. They belong to Jesus. Your sons and your daughters, your grandchildren, they belong to Jesus. Stretch forth. Stretch forth. He told Moses to stretch forth his hand and a sea opened up. What do you think will open up when you stretch forth your hand? You ought to go back to your houses. Look at your house and lift your hand and prophesy to your own house in the name of Jesus. And let God use your mouth to bless your house in Jesus' name. Hallelujah to the Lamb. that you let tie your hands. Committees, people, policies, rules and regulation and your hands are tied. You got your hands tied by bankers, mortgage folks, tied by debt, tied by bills, tied. Let go God's people and liberty come unto the house. In the name, the name, the name. In the name of Jesus, in the name, the name. Lift your hand toward God, say, Lord, I receive it, I receive it. I receive it, Jesus, I receive it. Be it unto me even according to your word. Be it unto me according to your word, God. In the name, the name, the name of Jesus. In the name, in the name, my God, my God, my God. God's going to show you some people in some low places, people that are stuck in pits, and he has anointed your hand to go forth. Stretch forth, stretch forth, stretch forth, stretch forth, stretch forth your hands. I'm just telling you, when you do, the power of the Holy Ghost is going to do something when you do it. When you do it, if you go, God will go with you. God will move through you. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. We're coming back to a day now where we will loose the hand of the Holy Ghost to say, God, do it through me. Do it through me. Do it through me. Do it through me. Go to the prison through me. Go to the hospital. Walk the hospitals through me, Jesus. Go to the halfway houses through me, Jesus. Use me, God. To folks that are down and out and homeless, use me. Go through me, God. Go through me. Deal with the alcoholics through me, Jesus. With the drug addicts through me, Lord. Use my hand, Lord. And as you stretch forth your hand, I, I declare and I decree in the name of Jesus that the power of God will flow through your hands. That anointing will be released. 
that blessings will be imparted and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. God will decree and declare his glory be manifested through his body. Once again, he's so hungry for his body to be activated in the world today. God's looking around and said, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with your hands? Why not use yours? I pray that you'll sing in your heart, God, here am I, use me, use me, use me, use me, God, use me for your glory, use me for your glory, use me as an impartation of blessing, God, into the lives of others in the world who don't know you. Use me, God, use me, use me, use me, use me, use me, use me, and you will find great grace and blessings coming to your life. And from your hand, whatever leaves your hand will never leave your life. It'll come back and it'll touch your children and your grandchildren. I'm here to tell you that God has never lost sight of any seed that you have sown and released from your hand. He said, what goes from your hand will never go from your life. And some of you have sown and your, seed, your fields are pregnant with seed. Harvest, a harvest coming back into your life. Harvest. It's harvest time. It is harvest time. The time of the harvest is at hand. My God, the kingdom of God, it is at hand. It is at hand. It's within your reach. It is within your reach. It's within your reach. Let him use your hands for his glory. Let him use you. Take your seats. we got a little more to tell you. When this angel came to Cornelius, the angel knew Cornelius' name. He knew Peter's two names, Simon and Peter. He knew Peter's address. He knew exactly where he was. God knows where you are. And he even knew when he talked to Peter, he knew the content of Cornelius' petition. He knew it. He knew it. He knew it. And here was Peter when he saw un unclean animals in the sheet. He refused to eat it because he was a devout Jew. Jews were not even allowed to touch what was considered to be unclean food. Thank you for watching Power for Living with Bishop Dale C. Bronner. Until next time, God bless you.